Hello friends and happy new year. So I want to quick go over the top 23 comic books that came out in 2023. First, I am going to do a really quick little honorable mention section because I tried really hard to catch up on every new book by the time this video was coming out. But I'm a slacker. There's a handful I am not caught up on, so I don't actually want to put them on the list, but they're super good. Absolutely worth checking out. Honorable mentions. Danger Street, have not caught up on it. I've heard it's on like everybody's list. It's only 12 issues, so I really have no excuse. Flash by Cy Spurrier. I love Cy Spurrier, and I love <laughs> the one issue I read of Flash, but it seems amazing, and I'm really, it's like probably the book I'm the most excited to catch up on. Under the influence, Mad Cave Studios has surprisingly been putting out really good stuff. The art on this book is really good. The story, really good. I've only read two issues, but under the influence, uh, I'm really into it. I'm really under the influence of this book. Hairball by Matt Kent. This book was so good. It reminded me of a, what was that Stephen King book? Cat's Eye? Something like that. But extremely good. I read, I believe, two issues of it. <laughs> There's already a hardcover out for it, I believe. Don't Spit Into the Wind, another Mad Cave book that I loved. I read exactly one issue, but the first issue was so good. The trade is out now, so I already have the trade ordered and I will read it that way but this book was really fun. Dark Ride by Joshua Williamson. I love this book. I love horror. I love amusement parks. It's a really fun indie. I read the first arc, fell in love with it. I just haven't caught up on the second arc yet, but the book is so good. A very just easy to digest indie book. Absolutely suggest. Midlife. I adore this book. If you saw on Instagram, I did post about it. The art is so good. I'm immediately into the entire cast of characters. It's very sweet. It's clearly full of heart and I'm really excited to catch up on it. I believe I read two issues, uh, but it's super good. Phantom Road, Jeff Lemire, clearly an esteemed writer for a reason, and Walta, who has worked on The Vision, which is an amazing story that I love. I read the first three issues of this book and I loved it, and that's as far as I've gotten. Catwoman, the teeny Howard run of Catwoman, I've been saying is one of my favorite DC comics on the shelf. I'm probably about an arc behind right now, but I love this book. The Teeny Howard run is absolutely where I suggest just hopping on with a character. I believe the first volume is Dangerous Liaisons and it's so good. Void Rivals has been like the biggest talk in comics for the year. I wasn't really intending on reading the stuff because I have no specific interest to Transformers, G.I. Joe, any of that stuff. I heard it was really good and I also heard that you didn't really need to know anything about Transformers or G.I. Joe or anything before stepping into these new series. And I figured I would start with Void Rivals because it came out first. The first issue, so much better than it had any right to be. If you have not read it because you don't care about Transformers and all that stuff, grab it. Void Rivals is so good. Seriously, like, crap it. Uh, last honorable mention, I haven't read a single issue of. Uh, the Many Deaths of Lila Star is one of my favorite books of all time. The same creative team is now doing a book called Rare Flavors. I haven't read it yet. There's like two, maybe three issues out right now. Rare Flavors is an honorable mention that I'm just throwing in because I assume it's going to be really good and I have not touched it yet. But honorable mentions aside, let me talk about the top 23 comic books that came out in 2023. Coming in at 23, we have Peacemaker Tries Hard, written by Kyle Starks, who is really good at doing that kind of like very like quick, witty kind of humor. I Hate This Place is also a very great thing to check out if you have not read it. But Peacemaker Tries Hard is only six issues. It is DC Black Label, so if you're not okay with cursing and stuff, this is not the book for you. There's a lot of that. But Peacemaker goes and finds a dog and then the entire six issue series is about him saving the dog. And it is a very fun romp. It's silly. I didn't really know much about Peacemaker before I was reading it. And I feel like now I like Peacemaker and beforehand I definitely would not have said that I do. The Art by Steve Ho, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, also goes really well with the story. Also, Bruce Wayne is so cute. For number 22, I did just throw an entire event onto the slot, but number 22 is going to be Night Terrors. I know Comic Chop News, Dan will be very annoyed at me because he does not like this, but I thought Night Terrors was very fun. Almost every series was really good. Like the Joker one was really funny. The Joker's worst nightmare is having a nine to five office job. Same, dude. That uh, actual main Night series title was really good. I love Dead Man. There was some great Casper Wingard art on there, but Night Terrors was, it was just that, it was fun. Like I had a great time reading it. Night Terrors also had some crazy, amazing cover art for a lot of books. Like seriously, it was an issue. I did not know what covers to pick for most books I got. For everything that was happening in Night Terrors, it was tying into what was actually going on in those character series, but not 
in a way that you would be penalized for not reading those characters' series at the time. It was more like fun Easter eggs, talking about what's going on, rather than like, oh man, I'm not cut up on Superman, so I can't read this. For 21, Detective Comics. The main story by Rom V is really good, but I have been obsessing over the backups. We have a stacked cast. We have Cy Spurrier, we have Dan Waters, we have Casper Wingard, and we have Danny on some of the art for backups. I feel like Detective Comics also gets much more experimental, like, well, this Batman run is good, it's really fun, but Batman is never going to do anything really dicey, you know? It's just gonna be... It's just gonna be Batman, like, they have to, it's, it's DC's main title. But Detective Comics, they can do some weird stuff with the same characters, and I really appreciate that. For number 20, I have a book that's really surprising to me. If you told me when this book was announced that this book would be one of my favorites of the year, I would not have believed you. Uh, this is Hunger and the Dusk. Hunger and the Dusk, written by G. Willow Wilson, with art by Christian Wild Goose from IDW, is something I never would have expected to like. I know this is a hot take for someone who is so deep into, like, nerd culture. I don't like high fantasy at all. When it comes to high fantasy, I, I don't like it. I don't like knights and dragons and elves and stuff. Like, I hate it. I hate it. I don't like Lord of the Rings. I don't like any of that stuff. It is the only nerdy thing I am not into. Obviously, I am not resilient to just good media, so every so often there'll be something I can enjoy, but I enjoy it because it's good enough to break away from the genre. And that's what I would say is true for Hunger in the Dusk. G. Willow Wilson can craft a story that can break out of this traditional high fantasy genre to make me, someone who hates this, love it enough especially to be one of my favorite books of the year. But if you are a curmudgeon like me and you don't like high fantasy, try Hunger in the Dusk. It's really good. Coming in at 19, this one does make sense. Uh, if you aren't aware, the thing that kind of got me into comics was Teen Titans. Uh, Thank you, Marv Wolfman and George Perez. Uh, I do really wish I got to meet George Perez. Uh, hopefully I will still get a chance to meet Marv Wolfman, but it is World's Finest Teen Titans. I love this book. Uh, it is almost always the very first book that I grab off of my stack whenever it's new that week. I love this book. The art is so fun. Mark Wade is doing great in this World's Finest universe. World's Finest Batman and Superman is also really fun. I love that slightly campier, older vibe. The one who I adore who does not get enough love and respect. And I'm going to prove it by not really knowing how to pronounce her name. Emanuela Lupacino, I believe I'm saying it correctly. Their art is so good. It matches so well with this almost cute story style. Uh, it's, it's everything I want from a Teen Titans book, especially when it's specifically Teen Titans. You're seeing a lot of like <laughs> the emotions running high. You know, there's gonna be someone's in love with someone, someone's arguing with someone. Like this is what I want from comics. I have gotten multiple people into comics by handing them this book. But if you're not allergic to fun, I absolutely suggest World's Finest Teen Titans. 18 is, for the first time in a long time, Harley Quinn. I am adoring this run. I think the Sweeney Boo art fits the character so well. It's very vibrant and cute, but not afraid to have an edge to it. Teeny Howard really has a voice for Harley Quinn. Reading the Catwoman run that Teeny Howard is crushing on, there's a few issues that Harley Quinn goes in there. And as soon as I read them, I was like, God, all I want is Teeny Howard to do a Harley Quinn run. Thankfully, my prayers have been answered. And this book is so good. The covers for this run, also great, because the cover is there by Sweeney Boo. We have Jenny Frizen covers in there. It's a very stacked cast for cover art on this one. We get to see a little bit of a little bit of Zatanna in her life, a little bit of Poison Ivy. I really like when they don't make Harley Quinn stupid. You know, maybe she's a little crazy. Maybe she doesn't make the best life decisions, but she is not stupid. They do a great balance of making her both both silly and smart. Coming in first, 17. The only reason this book isn't higher is because there's just not that many issues yet but I do really love it, and I'm surprised. This would be Green Lantern War Journal. Now, I always thought Jon Stewart Green Lantern was a little boring. I didn't dislike him, he's fine. I just think he's a little, a little milk toast, you know? Like he's just, he's a soldier and okay, fine. As far as Green Lanterns go, I'm a little more inclined to like Kyle Rayner, who's an artist and creative, or even Jessica Cruz, who is agrophoric, and I think that's such an interesting element to the character, even though I kind of like her as a Yellow Lantern more. But, unfortunately, Philip Kenny Johnson can do no wrong. Anything that man touches is definitely gonna be a worthy story. 
The artist is also new to me, it's someone named Montos, but they are definitely crushing it with this series. Adriana Lucas is a colorist that I do very much adore, and they definitely add a certain vibrancy that I think would be lost otherwise on this title. If you are not a Green Lantern person, this is definitely one to try. Coming in next, again, for the first time in my time consuming comics, especially ongoing as they're coming out, my number 16 is Superman. Joshua Williamson is touching every single character in the DC Universe right now. His hand is in every pot. Jamal Campbell doing the art on this really adds a sweetness to the character. And I really like how they're going through all these different genres. They're about to go do the Western one, which I'm really excited to read. This run is almost taking Superman back to what it should be. He's full of heart and he's doing his best. Uh, I have just added main title Superman to my pull list for the very first time. For number 15, uh, I know I should not kind of combine these two titles, but it's my list and I'm going to. Uh, Nightwing and Titans. I would give Titans their own spot, but it is also not that far into it. And they're in the middle of this big event. But this year we got to see Nightwing as a pirate. Uh, wow. Thank you, Tom Taylor. Whew, swoon. Uh, we had Bruno Redondo being the main artist for most of the run. Adriana Lucas being the colorist on Teen Titans. It was still Tom Taylor and we had Nicholas Scott being the artist, and personally, I'm someone who really cares about environmentalism, deforestation, all those kind of things. Those are causes that, that strike me into my heart, and they were going over that very much in Titans, so it was really pulling at my, at my heartstrings. I do adore Beast Boy, he's one of my favorite characters, and I'm biased. Like I said, Titans got me into comics. Also, in Nightwing this year, we got to see this strangely beautiful creation of Nightmite, who I didn't want to like. On paper, he's immediately going to be annoying, right? Like, that might, but a Nightwing version? If you're not reading Nightwing, you could probably just grab that book and read it on its own. And it's really sweet, because Nightwing has the biggest heart of any character, and that's part of why I love him so much. Yeah, Nightwing with little, in parentheses, Titans. Next up for 14, The Cull. Kelly Thompson, obviously, a very amazing writer. I don't think I've ever read anything from her that I didn't just absolutely adore. The art in this is amazing. It almost has like video game vibes to it. I have never heard of this artist before. Madia D. E. Lewis? I'm sorry, I'm probably butchering that, but the art on this is amazing. There are great covers for the run too. These friends that are looking for a friend of theirs that went missing, so it's a little, a little friend group, a nice, a nice tight tribe looking for someone that they love and they end up going into this different world. And this world, it's, it's another dimension. Like everything is different. The, the sky, the water, everything about this place is different and beautiful and scary. And it's full of these wonderfully unique creatures. I am a big sucker for creative creature design. And there are these big terrifying monsters and it is beautiful. I truly feel like I'm stepping into another world when I'm reading this comic. Coming up next for 13, we have Dracula. They're rebooting the Universal Monsters into this own little universe, and this one is written by James Tynan, with the most incredible art by Martin Simmons. You should pick this book up for the art alone. It is amazing. It is like nothing else on the shelf. I definitely want to get a piece of original art by him someday. It is beautiful and scary and stunning and provoking, and you have to pick up this book. I do really love what I would consider to be this tiny trope at this point, where when you open to the title page, it is a double page spread and it's always beautiful or it makes you feel something, you know? I feel like this book would definitely get a lot higher for me, but it's only two issues in right now. But I feel like it says a lot if this book is only two issues in and it's already one of the best books of the year for me. This is definitely a book I could hand to a lot of my friends who aren't into comics because the art is so amazing. Coming in next at 12 is Kill Your Darlings. Kind of a surprising book I didn't expect to love so much coming from Image Comics. This is written by Ethan S. Parker and Griffin Sheridan, who uh, you may have known from running around different comic-based podcasts. And the art team on this is Bob Quinn and John J. Hill. The very first issue of this book, they have a little girl playing. And whenever I see someone depicting a little girl playing, it's always like sparkle and unicorns and everything's pretty and perfect and there's sparkles everywhere and there's a tea party. Uh, and for this one, she's like, and my army at war. And she's like really like jumping around to try to defend her kingdom. And like, it's the most accurate representation of like how it actually is to be a little girl playing. And I love it. She does also have, you know, a pink little elephant and like all these little girly aspects, but that's not what it means to be a kid. 
But after the first book, she is no longer a little girl. And my god, does this book get wild, and I am so here for it. This book is so crazy in a great way. I am so excited to see more of the worlds they're creating in this book. I feel like we're also like at the point right now where later on I'm gonna look at it and I'm gonna be like, oh yeah, this is where it gets good. Which is so crazy to think because I've been so immersed into the story since like, I wanna say maybe three pages in, I was immediately sold. You need to read this. It is just a very like staple good image book, you know? Coming in at 11, Fantastic Four, written by Ryan North, who I did already adore, so I was excited to see him taking on a new part of the Marvel Universe here. The cover A's are almost always by Alex Ross, so they're phenomenal. And the art is by Ivan Coelho. This book will make you feel things. Ben is really good in this book. They do this in a subtle enough way that most people I know who are reading this didn't even notice it, but Ben's wife is blind and it's almost always done in a subtle way or like it's for comedic effect so you don't even notice it but he's always explaining visually what is happening in the world around to his blind wife he's such a good husband in this book i'm gonna sound like a callous horrible person but in the first issue they kind of explain away like oh man the kids aren't gonna be here for a year and i was like cool i love that i don't have to deal with annoying kids in this book with Ryan North writing this book, I'm sure he's gonna make me fall in love with the kids in a few issues too. Yeah, if you are not a Fantastic Four person, which is, I wanna say, most people, this is the run to grab. This book is so good. I can't believe I'm saying it, but I cannot recommend Fantastic Four enough. This book is, this book is beautiful. It really feels like it's becoming the heart of the Marvel Universe again, which is amazing, because that's how it should be. And it's definitely been a long time since that's been the case. Coming at number 10 is Poison Ivy. Poison Ivy is my favorite character, so it comes to no surprise for me that she's on my top 10 here. The cover A's on this book are by Jessica Fong, who is someone that I did not know of before this run, and now I adore their art. They have this uncanny ability to make Poison Ivy beautiful and sexy, but also scary and disgusting, and I love it. She is powerful, and I also love how all throughout the interiors of this book, Poison Ivy, who typically people would think of as very, like, sexy superhero kind of character, they make her, you know, she's still a beautiful lady, can't take that away, but she's usually just wearing like a green gardener jumpsuit or whatever. This book is by G. Willow Wilson, and I don't know if I ever want anyone else to do a Poison Ivy series. Takara does the art typically. I really liked her having to deal with the Floronic Man. That was, uh, that was one of the highlights of the run, definitely for me. This book was originally just going to be a mini series and then a maxi series and now it is an ongoing because it is just that good. So you don't just need to take my word for it. And also at my shop, I want to say this is the third best selling book. Like that's kind of crazy. I believe it's Batman and then Detective Comics and then Poison Ivy and then Amazing Spider-Man. That's how good this book is. As much as I would love to sit here and talk about Poison Ivy forever and ever, I'm not going to do that. So next up at number nine, is Batman City of Madness. This is a magazine-sized DC Black Label book from the possibly concerning mind of Christian Ward. You probably know Christian Ward from his amazing artwork. He does some trippy stuff. Black Bolt, phenomenal. Odyssey with Matt Fraction. He's got a knack for doing really trippy stuff, especially like space and celestial stuff. And this is a take on Batman, kind of combined with like an HP Lovecraftian world. And it is beautiful. It is definitely a book I recommend on art alone, but that's not necessary because the story is so good. This is only going to be, I believe, three issues? Maybe four. But I believe it's only going to be three issues and the first two are out right now. So I'm really excited to see how this concludes. If you don't want to have magazine single issues, DC Black Label books come out in beautiful hardcovers. And this is definitely a book that is worthy of hardcover treatment. Coming at number eight, there's Swan Songs. Swan Songs is written by W. Maxwell Prince, but it's an anthology book. Each book has a different artist, which I have been loving, and the artists they have chosen for each issue are some of the best artists currently working in the industry. The whole premise of this book, called Swan Songs, it's about endings, but what the ending is of is different for each story. The artists they've had so far, Martin Simmons, Casper Wingard, Felipe Andrade, Caitlin Yarsky, Alex ekman Lawn, who is one of my current favorites. I will consume anything he puts out. The next one's gonna be Martin Morazzo, who is his collaborator for Ice Cream Man. One of these was the end of the world. One of these was the end of a marriage. The end of a sentence. The end of anidonia, which means the end of the inability to feel pleasure. This book is poignant. It's beautiful. 
I want to say it's my favorite thing that Maxwell Prince has ever done. Each issue is... it's so beautiful. And since it's a true anthology, you can just grab any issue you like. Coming in at number seven is Action Comics. This year just saw the end of Philip Kennedy Johnson's run on Action Comics. It starts off with the War World Saga, with Ricardo Federici being one of the main artists who is phenomenal. We do end up getting to see a beautiful art with Metallo, who is my favorite Superman villain. Much like everyone else on the planet, I, I wanna say I like Superman more than the average person because the very first movie from the 70s was still one of my favorite movies. But outside of that, what Philip Kenny Johnson made me fall in love with Superman. Once I started reading the books that he touched, I could not stop. I was hungry for Superman and I went to go seek out whatever Superman content I could get. But if you don't like Superman, if you are medium on Superman, if you hate Superman, if you think Superman's boring, if you think Superman is overpowered, I implore you to check out Philip Kenny Johnson's run on Superman so you can fall in love with him the same way I did. This like singular run on Superman changed the entire way I think of him. I adore Lois Lane. She is badass. And I am so sad to see this man's run on this character end. And I understand it has to happen, you know, that's that's comics for you. Like he has to go put all his toys back in the toy box so everyone can play with them again. You don't have to buy an expensive trade for you have the DC app, it's all on there. The single issues are very, very easy to find. And now that they're used in back issue bins, you'll probably find them for like $2 or whatever. This man changed the way that I felt about a pillar of the DC universe and possibly the most important things to ever exist in comic books. So not that much can uh, hold a candle to that little Superman speech. My number six is going to be another title by Philip Kane Johnson, The Incredible Hulk. This run is disgusting. <laughs> there are big scary monsters and they do not try to make things pretty. Oh my goodness, I love the way. Hmm. Sometimes you can see Bruce Banner turn into the Hulk in a very visceral way, you know? But in this run, you also get to see how horrifying it is to change from the Hulk into Bruce Banner. And it's revolting. It makes your skin crawl. It makes you realize the agony this man is going through just to be who he is. This run is so good. Nick Klein typically does the art. Oh, Matthew Wilson is an amazing colorist. He does the colors for this run. Travel Foreman did an amazing job being a guest artist working with Man-Thing. They've truly taken him back to his horror roots, but also really showing the humanity of Bruce Banner. The dichotomy between the characters in this run is just beautiful. Coming at number five, we have The Deviant by James Tynan and Joshua Hickson, who is an incredible artist that I'm excited to see getting some limelight right now. Hickson's use of colors in this run is phenomenal. Tynan books have been having these beautiful designs, you know, like I was talking about the double page spreads, how they make everything seem very cinematic, how the location title will be in front of a panel before exploring that location further in later panels. This is only two issues in, but it is a Christmas horror story, if you will, about a serial killer. And it is not for the faint of heart. It definitely gets a little gory, but how do I love this book? If you like horror, this is probably the number one book from this year that you need to grab. Coming at number four, somehow, is The Penguin. I will tell you that I am biased. I love Tom King. Tom King is one of my favorite creators, but this is definitely a book that all you Tom King haters would also really like. He is truly a tortured, beaten down man, but he is not afraid to bite back. Raphael Della Torre does an amazing job with the art on this book. Also, the colors on this book really gives you the ambiance, the vibe. It tells you what you're supposed to be feeling. And Marcelo Maiolo, who I have not heard of before, does a phenomenal job on this run with that. Clayton Cowles crushes it with the letters, as he always does. But The Penguin was definitely one of the more surprising books for the year for me, just because a penguin ongoing run, like, who cares about that? Apparently me, and you should too, because it was easily one of the best things I've read this year. This book is a lot harsher than I thought Tom King could be. I think this is gonna make uh, Penguin one of my favorite rogues. Coming in at number three, we have Barnstormers. These Comixology originals getting reprinted by Dark Horse have been amazing. Scott Snyder is a little hit or miss for me, but that's kind of how I want things to be from artists, right? If everything is just consistently medium, you know, just good, that's not interesting to me. I wanna see you have really high highs and really low lows because I want you to experiment and throw things at the wall and see what sticks. And my God, does Barnstormer stick. Tulote, ridiculously incredible artist. And she is perfect 
for this book because it gives it that good old timey vibe. I definitely wasn't expecting to fall in love with this book the way that I did. I'll be honest with you, I was picking up for Tula Ote and not Scott Snyder. I do like Scott Snyder. When he does good, he does great. Like, his Swamp Thing run, beautiful, phenomenal. Severed, witches, terrifying, gross, like, disgusting and I love it. But Barnstorm Races is sweet and beautiful, it's poignant, it's loving, it's fun, and it's suspenseful. <laughs> it's also not a long book at all. I believe a trade will be coming out very soon, so definitely something to grab in the new year when you're looking for a book to read. And it is definitely a book that I would recommend to people who aren't necessarily into comics. This is something I could definitely get a lot of my friends to really love, and I plan on giving it to my roommate as soon as it's out in trade. Coming in at number two, which I thoroughly assumed would be my number one for most of the year, is going to be Double Feature Nightfall. I adore this book. Uh, I'm sure it's no secret that I love Vault Comics. I feel like they can do no wrong. They always put out books that'll be on the top of my list for each year. This one, uh, as the title suggests, double feature, it is a double feature. First half of the comic is one story, second half of the comic is a second story. There's a very cute little intermission. The first story in Nightfall Double Feature is The Cemeterians. It's by Daniel Krauss, who has done amazing work on books like The Autumnal, so I do really adore his work already, with artist Manhouse, who I was not aware of before this title, and a colorist is Kurt Michael Russell. Jim Campbell is a letter who does a great job anytime I see him on anything. That story is based on bones being found in places bones should not be found in. Like think in your pillow when you're sleeping, or maybe a girl's teddy bear has a little skeleton on the inside, and it is eerie, it is creepy. The second story is Denizen by David Andrew and Tim Daniel. The artist is Chris Sheehan, who I absolutely adore. Their work is phenomenal. I'm sure if you follow me on Instagram, you've heard me blow them up before, but Chris Sheehan, absolutely an artist me to look out for. Some of my favorite interior work there. Colorist Jason Wordy, amazing every single time I see anything by them. And that book is a little more, a uh, little more haunting. I like the, the mystery and intrigue involved in both of these titles where you don't really know what is happening or why it's happening. And if you like spooky things, I absolutely suggest this title. There's only one more issue left coming out in the new year, so I am very excited for there to be an actual collected edition. And then my number one for the year is going to be Beneath the Trees Where Nobody Sees. This book is by Patrick Horvath, who does both the art and the story. Hassan does do the letters, who is probably my favorite letters. I, I do adore their work. Uh, I ordered a lot of copies of this book before it came out because I thought that it was going to be a really good book. I love things that are both cute and creepy, and so I've been giving this to a lot of people who don't necessarily like comics because somehow all of my friends don't like comics. And I have gotten a lot of people asking me for more issues of this book. This book is kind of like Dexter, that serial killer TV show, meets Arthur the Aardvark, that cute cartoon. The book is entirely bipedal animal characters. The main protagonist here is a serial killer who has been spending their time in this nice, quaint little town, but in order to get that itch, to, to get the kills that she needs being a serial killer, they go out of town to kill people there, and never inside their own town. But now someone has been doing some killings in this town. Our main protagonist here has to figure out who's doing the killing so they don't accidentally get caught in everything they've been doing. And this book is equal parts cute and gory. There's only two issues out, but it is the book I am the most blown away by, surprised by, and excited for this year. This book is seeing significant resale values, and it's purely because the book is good, and I love that. I love when we see stories having value just because of how good they are, because people desire to read this book after what everyone's saying. As long as you're okay with minor gore, you know, some cartoony blood or maybe like some cartoony organs, this is still definitely a book that I would suggest picking up. I think that this is going to appear on a lot of people's best of 2023 comics. It has taken the little comic community by storm, honestly. And I gotta say, I am really excited for the next issue. They have been doing more printings, so it's definitely not too late to try and get your hands on a later printing copy of the first issue. But I, for one, am extremely excited to see where this book goes. So that's it, that's my top 23 of 2023, with a few honorable mentions thrown in there, because I'm a horrible slacker who's not cut up on all my books. So if there are any books that you really loved this year that I did not mention, please let me know. Give me some stuff to catch up on in this next month. Please let me know anything that I should be reading and let me know any like breakout creators that you really fell in love with this year, whether they were unknown and they just started putting stuff out now or if it's just someone you discovered. Let me know the creators that are really sticking out to you for 2023. I hope you guys all have a really lovely 2024 and I'm really excited to see what the next year in comics brings to us. 
Happy New Year, friends.